Next, from Springfield, Illinois Supreme Court Justice Mary Jane Tice delivers the keynote address to the Sangamon County Bar Association, where she discusses the growing role of women in the legal profession. This runs about 15 minutes. Thank you, John. That was really informative and very impressive presentation and uh, entirely enjoyable. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Justice Mary Jane Tice, our keynote speaker tonight. Justice Tice has served at every level of the judiciary, including associate judge, a circuit judge, an appellate justice, and a Supreme Court justice, much like our own Justice Rita Garman. Justice Tice has served in the past as president of the Illinois Judges Association, president and founding member of the Illinois Judges Foundation, president of the Appellate Lawyers Association, a member of the Board of Governors of the Illinois State Bar Association, and a member of the Board of Managers of the Chicago Bar Association. She's a natural born leader, a scholar of the law, and a judge's judge. She is respected around the state for her temperament, her legal ability, and her devotion to serving both the bench and the bar. But now I'm going to tell you a few things about Justice Tice that you may not know. <clears throat> she's a runner. She's a grandmother to two sets of twins. And she's married to John Tice. Not to be confused with our ISBA president, John Tice. I, I don't know, where, where's John sitting? Oh, I have to look at you, John, when I say this. Who's here with us tonight? And uh, this can be very interesting sometimes because when these two couples stay at the same hotel in Chicago for a conference or something, Terry Thies may get the key to John Tice's room, and John Thies may get the key to Mary Jane Tice's room. But we all know whatever happens in Chicago stays in Chicago. So please welcome Justice Mary Jane Tice, our keynote speaker. That actually happened. <laughs> we were, there was some event, and uh, uh, we both, my husband and I were both going, and uh, the deal was, you know, check in, whoever gets there first. So my husband came to the hotel and said, uh, uh, he was going to check in, they said, oh, your wife's already checked in, and gave him the key. And he went upstairs and walked in the room, and there were some clothes on the bed. And he thought, those don't look like Mary Jane's clothes. <laughs> I'll also tell you, we've gotten two bills from the hotel one time for our room in the thesis room, and one time we got no bill, so sometimes it works out. Um, and as Carol's pointed out, I am a bit of a bar junkie. Uh, to me, uh, the organized bar is, is some a very important force in our community, and so tonight I am thrilled to be here in a celebration of the organized bar really coming together. So tonight we have the Sagamon County Bar Association, the Lincoln Douglas Inn of Court, the Government Bar Association, and the Central Illinois Women's Bar Association all coming together for this wonderful event. And the, the title today, uh, The Profession of Leadership, I think, uh, sends a message that um, you as bar uh, people, people who are active, uh, active in the bar, you are in fact leaders of lawyers. But you also recognize that lawyers are leaders in our communities. And certainly your commitment tonight, a portion of the proceeds from the dinner tonight, will go to the Land of Lincoln uh, Legal Assistance Foundation, is a really important message about the bar's commitment to the larger community. I am deeply honored by the presence of my colleagues here tonight. Um, certainly, it is very appropriate that the court is here because Springfield and Sagamon County is the Supreme Court's home. Uh, this is, uh, the court is part of this community. And for each of us, that building on 2nd Street is literally our home away from home. Uh, everyone always wants to talk about that living situation. What's the deal with that? Well, it is true that on the third floor of that beautiful building, uh, there are seven small rooms. Now, I promise you they're small. A bedroom, a bathroom, and a small office. And yes, there is a communal dining table. We eat all of our meals together. And yes, we sit in a seat by seniority. 
It's a little like the convent. <laughs> but it's purposeful. Uh, there's a great tradition behind why uh, we in Illinois have chosen to live in this way. And in fact, it's a tradition that was started by Chief Judge, uh, Justice John Marshall of the United States Supreme Court in the earliest days of our country. And his thought was that um, it was appropriate, it was necessary really, to form uh, uh, the image and the integrity, the, the oneness of this new institution of the Supreme Court. And in some ways, uh, we're very familiar with the fact that it was Chief Justice John Marshall who actually uh, structured opinions the way we all do today. Um, Justice Tice delivers the opinion of the court. We speak in one voice. And that, that certainly was an important piece of how John Marshall wanted to, to forge the institution of the United States Supreme Court. But he also did that by uh, uh, bringing together all of the justices of the United States Supreme Court and had them live together in a rooming house in uh, Washington, D.C. This is how Justice Joseph Story described it. My brethren are very interesting men with whom I live in the most frank and unaffected intimacy. We are all united as one with mutual esteem which makes even the labor of jurisprudence light. Chief Justice Marshall understood wisely that in an institution of shared decision making, better decisions are made when the members have real respect for each other, know each other, uh, know each other's people, have genuine relationships. And the most important time for that basis is when the time comes to disagree, so that dissent comes from a place of respect. So on the third floor and on the second floor of our home on Second Street, we talk about travel, and we talk about family, and this may surprise you, occasionally, Justice Thomas talks about football. <laughs> but in the last two years I have lived on Second Street, my respect for these people has just deepened every day. They are people who are committed to doing justice. They are as passionate about compelling constitutional issues as they are about issues that perhaps are not quite so exciting, things like res judicata and jurisdiction and things like that. They are deeply concerned about the fairness of our system, from access to justice to juvenile justice. Their commitment to justice, for me, makes the labor of jurisprudence light. John Lipton is such a gift to our state. Uh, he makes history come alive. Um, and that's especially important tonight, uh, this wonderful presentation, and to actually have uh, the members of the Templeman family here just brings it all together. But tonight we're celebrating the Central Illinois Women's Bar Association's 30th uh, anniversary. And, and I think I enjoy history very much, and I think one of the, the, the important things about talking about history is that we need to keep telling the stories. Keep remembering where we were so that we know who we are today. What would these women that John talked about tonight, what would they think of our court today where three members are women? Women like Irma Templeman made our way easier. Now, I am not a heron like Myra Bradwell or Irma Templeton or Marianne McMorrow. Uh, I came to law school at a time when there was a, uh, right at the, the, the crest, really, of the first wave of women uh, coming into law school. My husband's a year ahead of me, and uh, in his class there were seven law student, women law students. In my class, one year later, there were 30. Now, this was a huge change, but obviously not like today, where almost 50% of law school classes are women. Um, when I first began to practice law, I was a public defender. And when I, uh, my, one, of my first assignments, one of my first assignments was at uh, the Criminal Courts Building in Chicago at 26 in California, and there was one other woman who was a public defender. There were two women who were assistant state's attorneys. When I became a judge, it was kind of a big deal. There were 18 people from Cook County It was in our class, and there were two women, and it was a huge news story that there were two women, can you imagine that, who had become judges. And when I went back to 26th Street as a judge, there was one other woman in my class. So I am not a pioneer. However, for a lot of my life, a lot of my career, I was the only woman in the room. I had very few role models, very few mentors who I could talk to. Uh, there was no one I could say, 
Do you think I could wear pants when I make a closing argument to a jury? <laughs> and what do I do when my three-year-old wakes up with an ear infection and I'm supposed to be picking a jury? Or just basic things. Am I doing this right? How are my cross-examinations? There were no other women who could be, who were ahead of me, who could mentor me. In my life, I developed male mentors because there were wonderful men ahead of me, more experienced, who were willing to reach out to younger women like me. I met Tom Fitzgerald when he was a state's attorney and I was a public defender. Very soon he became a judge and I tried a number of cases in his courtroom. He was a great teacher and I know he made me a better lawyer. He is the person who encouraged me to file an application to be an associate judge. He encouraged me to be involved in the organized bar, to teach, to be involved with judicial ethics. This is a man, a great and good man, who shaped my career and I am so proud to be sitting in his seat on the Illinois Supreme Court. So in many ways, uh, the profession is different today from Irma Templeton, but certainly even different from my time. We know that just by looking around, the number of women who have joined our profession. Today at oral argument, we noted that there was one case where all of the lawyers in the case were women. Actually, that's not unusual. We see that a lot. It happened today, I think, that we noticed it only because we were coming here today. So the numbers have changed. There is no doubt about that. But there are still important issues that remain for women lawyers. And I think the number one issue that uh, it concerns women today is the retention of women in the profession. The statistics are very clear that while there are many women who are entering the profession, there are very few at the top levels of firms and in decision-making capacities. Now we know that a life in the law is demanding, but it's especially so for women in their childbearing years. Many do not return to the profession. And so we are losing many, many wonderful lawyers, and we're not developing as many experienced women lawyers as we need to mentor the ones that will come next. I can't tell you how often I get a call like this. Judge, could I talk to you? Could we have lunch? and I think I know where this is going. <clears throat> the young woman lawyer will say to me, how did you do that? How did you do that? How did you raise kids and still practice law? The problem is I don't really have a good answer. I wish I did. I mean, it's one thing I know, one thing I am absolutely sure about, you have to have a supportive partner. So wherever you are, thank you, John T. Tice, for everything you've done for me. He's not here for he's in Chicago. I wouldn't be standing here except for him. But it's also important to have supported supervisors and managing partners, men and women, people who see the value in accommodating a young mother now in order to retain a great litigator in the future. Now these issues are not just about young women. In the past, when a man went to law school, you knew what your life would be. Uh, you wouldn't see your children go to school, you wouldn't see their sports events, you wouldn't uh, go to their plays. Young men today want to have a balance in their lives as well. And our uh, profession has to adapt to them. That's what's so great about history. We learn the lessons and we assess where we are today. You are the leaders of the organized bar. In our state's history, the bar has been courageous in its support of women lawyers. The ISBA was founded in 1877, and two years later, the ISBA made Myra Bradwell an honorary member. That is our tradition, and I know as a profession of leadership, you will continue that tradition. Finally, let me say this. I always think at events like this, it's nice to take a moment and remember why we went to law school. What got us here? And I always suspect at some level, for every single person here. We chose to be a lawyer because we wanted to work for justice. And then life comes along. The pressures of running a law firm, 24 oral arguments in two weeks, uh, the pressures of mount and mount, and it's really hard to see what this has to do with working for justice. All I can say is this, here's my advice. Keep searching for it. Tomorrow when you go back to work, Look again, it's there 
It's on your desk. Keep searching for justice and you will find joy and meaning in our wonderful profession. Thank you so much. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.